Doug, good morning. Hey, good morning. Do you ever use your phone for investment things? I use my phone for all sorts of things. I'm learning to do investment things better on it. The Fidelity app is a really cool thing to have on your telephone. Like my dad, he could have only dreamt of having Peter Lynch on his telephone back in 1985. I mean, you could have us on your telephone right now. <laughs> yeah, you could. you could. I mean, how sweet. You guys probably don't appreciate how sweet that is, but people uh, really enjoy hanging out with us if I don't say so myself. I mean, there are several folks out there who you don't have a desktop computer. You don't have a laptop computer. You've got maybe an iPad or an iPhone or something like that. And if you do have one of those... Um, Give me a buzz about the Fidelity app because I'd love to talk with you about it, some of the pros about it, and then share with you some of the things it can't do. But um, if you are using a iPad or a phone, download it and then give me a buzz. Let's let's talk about it together. And we have our standard disclaimer. Basically, what we're going to say here this morning is our opinions. You can agree or disagree, and you can even call us and tell us if you agree or disagree. And most likely, we're not going to have our feelings hurt because our opinions have been proven right and wrong um, randomly, depending on what we continue to discover. And that's a lot of what I wanted to talk about today, Doug. But um, with a smile on my face, I say, don't stock up on Kentucky here. And that may be... Uh, offensive to a couple of you. Oh, I have to. I look. almost called one of you last night. <laughs> I have to look and see. <laughs> uh, just, to, just to do a uh, a welfare check to see how you are doing, and uh, so anyway, I don't. I don't see any of our. Uh, and pop our, it back up. Pop it back up. Let me. Let me just do a double check here. Yeah. Do you see a UK okay, people? I think are, we're all right. Yeah. So if you're watching this on the replay, <laughs> and you want to call me with a, uh, you know, just feedback, I, I'm here for you. And, and I mean, you know, UK has got a stellar history. I felt as crazy as it is, I felt bad for John Calipari, which I didn't think those words would ever I, I come out of my mouth. You know, I, I did not. Yeah. Did, did, you, did you see his exit interview? No, I didn't. Eh. Okay. I mean, nice sports coat and great pinstripe shirt. Though. Yeah, he was looking good, but to think that they got smacked twice in the last two or three years by a, a low level, like if you got smacked by one once, you'd think you would be prep, prepared to come out with your A game. And they as could not guy, stop those guys last night. As a guy who is in the uh, March Madness every day of the stock market, I can appreciate getting upset by a 16th seed or a 14th seed or whatever. <laughs> well, I wanted to throw out there, I've been pondering, which is probably the word, but I've been considering another version of it. There, there's an old saying, it was when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. And when I became a man, I put away childish things. And and that has a lot to do with what we do for you, is how we um, reason. And, and I thought I'd just talk about the whole process a little bit, because when you think about kids, they speak just whatever hits their thoughts, right? They just say it. And... You probably don't get too offended by little kids, what they say, because they're just saying what they think. But reasoning is the process of taking a thought and sorting through it to determine um, the validity and the value of that particular thought. And um, reason also includes whether it's that thought's true or false. And so when you're learning something, the teacher also often is assumed true. And, and so a lot of what I've learned in the investment business over the years was contradictory to things I was taught in my CFP studies and my university studies. And so then you're like, well, um, did they lie to me? But the answer might be no. They, they reasoned out what they thought was so, 
but there there was maybe missing data that brought it to light that huh it's really interesting so so that's what uh I kind of wanted to throw out there to you and, and maybe if we get time, talk about how we reason through some of the decisions we do. And reasoning, I said, is the process of processing your thoughts to see if they're true or reasonable. And and this is one of my favorite childhood books. Do you know this book, Doug? Uh, only through you. Yeah, this, this book was a staple when I was a kid. It's called The Emperor's New Clothes. And um, the... the the illustrator on this is, I think, remarkable. This is probably set you back eight or 10 bucks. I don't know what it cost you if you got this. The essence of the story was the emperor lacked self-confidence to be a self-thinker. And he let these charlatans come in and sell him clothes that weren't clothes. It's, I just like that word. It's a good word, isn't it? You got, why don't you all use that today? Can you guys use that word today? It's a fun word. Um but but you th you and I usually think a leader has self confidence and reasons through their thoughts, but that's probably a false idea, because I mean even even with Gimbal during COVID, we didn't reason that the information coming through the media was true. And if you go back and look at old like replays, we were going through the data and explaining our opinions why we didn't think what was being said was true. Yeah, we looked at a lot of data. Yeah, not that that gets you. And we we, a, we weren't right trying to be. Just, we weren't trying to be just information. Right, we weren't trying to be woke or unwoke or anything. We were just looking at the data and reasoning through is what we're hearing true, and we we didn't conclude it was. I don't think. And really, some of the like for me, one of the first things was when I when I was researching, you know, the size of it. I don't even what you call a virus, uh, like the one one unit of like the the germ, how the size of it, it, it was smaller than the mass like threads. And so I just envisioned trying to catch a minnow with a big fishing net was what that was. That's how I envisioned it. But then other people were presenting thoughts to me to make me feel like I was wrong, but I don't think the data ever disproved that. But that's just an idea of re thinking versus reasoning and not even getting emotional about it because I'm wrong all the time. You mentioned already that as well. So in this, the emperor- I mentioned that you were wrong? No, that you were when you're talking about your stocks. You, you know I'm wrong all the time. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't think I did that. Yeah, no, you said you were with the yeah, stocks. Yeah, I'm, I'm wrong. A so lot. I can show you how often I'm- So the king was, he was sold uh, invisible clothes and the entire population believed, they didn't believe, they just said, oh yes, that's a beautiful wardrobe, except for one child. And the child said, he's naked. And all of a sudden, the voice of reason <clears throat> settled it out. And, and this was, this idea was given to me as a young man. I just, the idea of it is always stuck in my head. It's like, why don't I, if the king isn't, the emperor isn't going to be reasonable, I have to be reasonable myself. And I think that's what that story taught me as a youngster. And so um, that's, that's a thought process and, and then how it gets into what we're talking about. I had to borrow, my son is a woodworker, I had to borrow his saw. Do you guys have saws? Do you have one? Maybe. A hand saw. Don't know. Well, actually, yeah, I got a hacksaw. Is that yeah, count? no, no, it's, it's not the one I wanted, but yeah, a hacksaw counts. But I was wanting, uh, this is a DeWalt and, and it was sharp. And so this this is what, most of us have been taught the market is that if this is the beginning over here and you go up over time, it's like a saw blade. It, it goes up. And so you should buy and hold, right? Right. That's what we've been taught. And um, I just did some artwork on here. I don't know if you all can see my artwork. I thought I saw some lines that I that I uh, recognized. Yeah, I had to ask Caleb if I could draw on his saw. And so kind of hard to see. Why don't you spell it out with your finger? Yeah, see it right here. <clears throat> this is really how the saw blade can work. That it it does historically go like this. The markets historically have gone like this, but you get times every once in a while where they drop down like this for an extended period of time. And that is the reason we had to rethink our thoughts on buy and hold, right? Yeah. 
I mean, did you believe buy and hold for a long time? Sure. Yeah, all the way through, all the way through two thousand eight. And and I'm and frankly, um, if you if you are believing something that's not true, it can create stress unnecessarily in your life. I think. Like if you believe a lie and you move forward with that, it creates stress. So in 2008, you saw me go through depression, right? Yeah. And and it was because I was torn between two theories. And the theory that I had been believing is buy and hold works, but I didn't believe it in my core. So I had to pick up the phone and when somebody would call in and just say, hey, uh, just hold in there. It's going to work out all right. And that felt like to me a lie. Because I didn't believe it would because the reason I didn't believe it would was because of this right here. If each one of these jagged edges was a year, that's probably most of the propaganda we see is a long-term chart like that. And then if you go down in value and it takes 20 years for it to catch up, it's not going to be okay if you're 70. Right. It's not going to be okay if you're 60 most likely because there's a thing called spin down that... If you're pulling out 6%, but the market drops 30%, your 6% is going to be a much higher rate of return on your remaining capital, and most likely you're going to spend down your principal. And so to look somebody in the face and tell them it's going to be okay, I didn't really believe it. I, we have peers in the industry that, that they believe that. Don't you think? You don't think they're lying to people. They, they really believe it'll yeah. be okay. They, they believe it will be okay, and then they have data points that they can act off of. And then my favorite one is there's a tool that guys like us can buy that is a forecaster to, to show you that it'll be all right in the future. And it would be like the weatherman trying to say, hey, it's going to be sunny in 75 for the Indy 500. Right, right. <laughs> it's uh, That one's called the, what's that tool called? It's, um, uh, what's it called? Start with the M. M. Um, Gosh. Oh, it's terrible. I give up. What is it? We'll get back. Monte, Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo. Because Monte, Monte Carlo takes all the data and supposedly randomizes it so that you have random rates of return. But it, but the, the part of all of this that I was getting to, and, and it comes from a, a appointment many years ago with my doctor. I love George. He's one of the coolest men I know. And I said something about how great he is. And he's like, I'm, the, I'm not really that great. Really all being a doctor is, is taking the statistics and comparing what you yeah, tell me you right. have and, and statistically guessing what it is. So, so don't think I'm that high on my hog keeping it. And, and so in the idea of statistics, there's a thing called a sample size. And a sample size can tell you how accurate your statistics are. So if you get a sample of two or three things out of a million possibilities, it's not a big enough sample size to project what's gonna happen. But if you got a sample size of 200,000 out of a million, you could begin statistically putting some reasonable thoughts together. And what I've always known is the sample size of the US stock market is just a little over 100, maybe 125 years of a sample size. And in world history, that's such, that's a minutia, right? And, and so if you put the U.S. economics with the entire world history sample size, the data doesn't stack up very well because very few economies last really, really long. And so th that always banged in my head, like the sample size seems really small and people are presenting kind of pound the table thoughts on such a small sample size. Have you ever thought of it that way or is that just me really grinding away at it? It was earlier this week I was driving and I don't know if your best thoughts come while you're driving or not, but it's good thinking time. And one of the thoughts I had was whether it's a, a really great mutual fund brand or whether it's the partners that we partnered with these are just people trying to do the best they can. Whereas in 2008 or maybe 1988 and 1998 to 2008, that period when I first started in the business, I really gave too much credence 
to the people making the decisions. And I say, hey, they, they know what they're doing and we can trust them. Um, but they're just, they're, they're like us. They're just doing the best they can with the data they have. And um, so it was 2008 into 2009 that we started to say, hey, the buck stops here. I think you gave me a, a buck knife recently and the buck stops here. And it's so good to have data that we can look at and formulate our own opinions. And you all have to do that with your retirement too. Now you're the ones directing us, you know, what you're dreaming of, what you're thinking of, how your cash flow is looking, where you're spending. And we we need to hear from you on those data points. We don't we don't live in your shoes. I th I think what I was asked to speak last week, and I, I chose to speak on this idea of speaking, thinking, and reasoning like a child. But all of this has evolved in what I do professionally. And I was speaking with probably a 22 year old who is a financial advisor at a bank, and I love this young man. Um, but he was being honest with me. He's like, I don't know what I'm doing. That's amazing. Right. That's, really good. And that's a great place to start. Because the, the expectation that I think the whole industry, I think, this is my opinion, the whole industry is moving to, is that if we as an industry can present to investors that you can just trust us for the long term, then you don't have to think about it. It's like depositing your money in a savings account. Like you can just do the same thing with your investment side. There's no risk to it. And we've said over and over again that we believe William O'Neill's statement that all stocks are speculative, which could go to mutual funds or other things, right? Like, because they're comprised of those things. And and so if people honestly told you that what you do is speculating, you might be a little more cautious about it. But I think the industry is trying to neutralize that. And I think it's going to blow up on them one day. I don't know when. I, I love the industry or the regulators. Hey, don't buy stocks. Right. Well, what what are the respected mutual fund companies or endowments doing? Right. They're buying stocks. Right. <laughs> it's it, and and so um like I think of the things that I said when I was a child in this business and what I believed, and then I've had plenty of time to reason it out. And and I'm just really humbled to to be able to talk about this part of the business. Like, tell me this, Doug, would you invest more aggressively for yourself or our average client? Uh, good question. Right now, it, it's about the same. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 I, I would do more aggressive for Keith. Yeah. I mean, just it depends what type of market we're in. Yeah. But uh, right now, it's, it's about equal. And part of that is we don't know how you think or reason until we do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and and if you reason that buy and hold is the best way and you see Doug do transactions, um, you you may think, well, why is he doing that? Is he churning my account? Well, that's a 1980s thought when you paid commission mm -hmm. and very few people pay commission anymore. And so churning is a idea that was planted by the financial system to distrust your advisor. But I don't think anybody really, I mean, pe people cheat. They will always cheat. But I don't think anybody churns because you don't get paid commission anymore. We don't get paid commission. And so so you don't, don't theoretically churn, but that idea is still in people's head as a fact that happens. And it probably doesn't. Yeah, so so what I was saying with the, with the, the, the saw blade there in that big dip in time, the, the reason I couldn't look you in the face and be completely honest that everything's going to be okay is a risk that's called point in time risk. And I don't, that's supposedly what the Monte Carlo helps with the point in time risk. But the problem with the point in time risk is it has a lot to do with your age. Like you can take a different point in time risk than I can. And that's roughly a 15 year span in our ages. And it, what point in time risk says that I'll give you an example here. I'll, I'll, I can't believe you're talking about point in time risk. Another drive this week, I was thinking about point in time risk. I was thinking, what if someone uh, invested a half a million dollars or a million dollars with Gimbal today? What would I be telling them? Well, our portfolios are, are nearly hitting our targets where we want to be. Right. And 
the point in time risk for me has changed a lot. I don't know what you're going to say. Yeah, but yeah. The point in time risk for me has changed a lot because you can exit. You can exit a position. You can exit the whole portfolio. Whereas point in time risk was once built upon this idea that you buy this mix of investments and you hang on to them for kingdom come. And, yeah. and you would have serious point in time risk then. I, that, that's that's what I was going at. Is okay. that's, I think if, if I boiled down the things that caused me to have depression in 2008, and I'm going to say something offensive here. This thought hit me this week so don't be offended it's still it hasn't been reasoned out to be. yeah it hasn't been reasoned out it was just thought out and so i'll reason it i said worry is a thought not reasoned out so you guys <laughs> you take don't that worry about that you, yeah so so in 08 i couldn't get out of your accounts because I didn't believe that was a possibility. He, he didn't know it was a possibility. In 2000, 2001, I wouldn't do it because like I, in my core, spending time with William O'Neill, thought when the planes hit the tower, the best thing we can do for our clients is get them out of the market. But the thought that I had was that's not patriotic. Right. And exactly. so that was a thought that limited me. I think that from, was a message even sent from the top brass of the United States. Right. But what's not patriotic is you taking care of your own responsibility, right? Like the, the, the patriot is, I need to look out for Keith and our country. And if I look out for Keith's well-being and understand our country is part of it, I need to make, make reasonable decisions. Can I share I think. what I think about point in time risk? Yes, like go for it. So today, here's what I think about point in time risk. And if you want to talk about this more, call me. But point in time risk to me is very different than I thought it was. 10 years ago. When I think about point in time risk today, I'm thinking about the investment we might make on your behalf right now. And we know that that buy point that we would make, let's say on your next purchase, it's kind of like this, the, the a spaceship taking off. It's vulnerable at that point in time, at that lift off. We want to see it go or start to go but any sign of weakness, we want to exit. And that's a beautiful thing to know that you can exit out or you can have a small loss and you can get out. And so the point in time risk is just different. Whereas I once thought it was, okay, there's only a certain few days in the market that are good. I want to be in those days. Whereas now it's based off, off the lift off of the purchase. And, and what you were just saying there, a lot, most of us have heard that old saying, live to fight another day. That's what you're talking about, the point in time risk, is that we know there's a good chance we're going to be wrong 50% of the time when we make a decision. <laughs> I hate to say it, even more than that. Yeah, we'll just say 50. We'll give you the benefit of the doubt. And, and what buy and hold does, it disguises that 50%. And let me give you an example of that when I show you what point in time risk, because I don't think I've really explained point in time risk to you all, but point in time risk says, this is this is the NASDAQ, and this goes back to 20, 2005, March 22nd, 2005. And so what point in time risk says, <clears throat> essentially, if I bought here into the NASDAQ, there was a point in time that if I bought and held, I was down 78%. If I bought from there to there. But where is there to there? Just give us give me some dates. January of 2000. No, I think that, that like 2000. 2000. January 2000, all the way over here. Um, no, that one's not. That one's not. I'm sorry. I misled you guys. That That isn't the one. I need to uh, go out farther because that's not 78%. That's that's probably 20%, 25% between January and September that year. What happened, I'll just move forward for you all. Uh, I'll put in 2006. So remember the 2153, that's off to the left of your screen. You can't see it anymore. And over here, it looks like the low. Boy, I'm not seeing it on here. Let me pull up the weekly. Sorry about that, friends. 
Yeah, I didn't have the right data on there. Sorry, yeah, friends. Is, uh, yeah, because like it should have been five thousand. Two thousand. Yeah, it was five thousand over here. Yeah. Uh, Man, it has it. So yeah, it dropped. It dropped. Uh, right here it is. Phil and I were just looking at this this week. He yeah, gave me a study. Yeah, yeah. Phil and I did this study this week. March of two thousand, it peaked out around five thousand and seventy eight, and then it was down to eleven hundred over here. And, and so, so if you want to use a data set, that that is a possibility of buy and hold. Hey, can you? So let me let me finish okay, this thought. Okay. Yeah. So so that's the part when I'm saying the data sample isn't big enough. So point in time risk is I retire at seventy and I put my money in something like this at 70 and it drops that 78% in the next three years, I am never recovering from that. And so what I had a hard time back in there was looking you in the face and believing what all the systems were telling us. Like we had really intelligent people telling us to buy and hold, but there's enough data like this. I could go back, I could give you probably 30 different data sets that tell you that that's not true, that you can buy and hold. And then another kind of point in time risk thing before I turn the mic over to you, I, I just had this idea. Suppose you lived in Indianapolis and you had a portfolio of a local pharmaceutical company and it made you thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. And paid you dividends. Did, did, did that make you feel smart? Did that make you feel knowledgeable about what you were doing? And if if it could even give you an arrogance and confidence to tell people this is how it works. But if if you are honest and you look yourself in the mirror, do I own that stock out of sheer coincidence or luck? Like I happened to go to work there and they happened to give me this stock and it happened to go up because I could give you a hundred, probably more than a hundred. I worked at the cousin pharmaceutical company that didn't go up. Or if you, we have clients that worked at a phone company here and that stock has consistently gone down since probably 1999 or 2000. And, and so just th th these are, I'm not, I'm not saying anything about those things. Yeah. I'm just saying that's, that that's the idea that of thinking and reasoning about a situation. You, I interrupted you. You were going to say something. Oh, I was just going to go into real time where we are. Um, oh, well, let me go so about reasoning. We don't too. Have to yeah, so so um, part of how we think we've been reasoning better is with our friend, uh, Mark Minervini. We've mentioned his name in the past. And it's unbelievable, a non-college graduate, I don't think he graduated from high school. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't think he did. And he has taught us so much about helping you that almost seems like epiphanies, like, wow, how did I not see this before now? And his ideas are really basic. And they're building blocks off of William O'Neill's. And then we have some other friends who have taken ideas like this as well. And, and so the idea of point in time risk, I guess what I was going to is if you think about it like we have, uh, we can really help get a lot of that out of a portfolio for somebody. What fight are we going to pick next? Asset allocation? Ooh. I had another idea to pick a fight today, but we I've, I've exhausted a lot of time. What, what did you want? Do you want to look nah, at the market or nah, do that next time? We, don't, we can do it next time. We're still in a bull market. Actually, I won't do it next time because I'm going to Florida. Doug, I hope you get some good sun with your uh, sunscreen on, your sun shielding clothes on. and You just get, to, like, hopefully you just see your eyes through there so that you don't yeah, get any of that. That's going to be the way it is. Well, I am thankful for you all. If you haven't read this book, I put I put it on the top of your to-do list. It's a, it's a classic. And it's only probably 44 pages. That's my kind of book right there. We'll see you soon.